so far we've been seeing that we can use Argand diagrams. More or less exclusively, we've been re representing like single complex numbers or individual complex numbers, I should say. And we've been re representing them as points or as vectors, right? But the important thing is there are individual complex numbers and it's like here's Z1. Boop, there it is, right? And here's Z2, here's Z1 plus Z2, but there they are all kind of isolated from each other. Okay? Now this is analogous to in the Cartesian plane, rather than the complex plane, if I give you sets of coordinates, you can say, oh, here's 3, 1, boop, you know, negative 1, negative 4, you can pop them all there, okay? But instead of if pro providing you individual numbers, I say give you a relationship between the ordered pairs, then instead of getting individual points or vectors, you get curves or regions, right? For instance, just think in terms of the Cartesian plane. If you have to think about not just some actual coordinates, but if I say, okay, y equals x squared. Now, we all know what y equals x squared looks like, but what, what does that mean, right? Well, what it means is, I'm not, not looking at a, um, a bunch of individual points, but I'm looking at that set of points. All of the points such that if you look at y, its value is the x value squared. Okay, it's a set of points, it's a collection, it's a curve. I could ask for a region as well. I could say, well, can you, um, can you tell me where the set of points is where x is greater than zero? And you would say, well, here's x is equal to zero. I'm not including the boundary, but everything else to the right hand side, all of those points, every single one of them satisfies that inequality, right? So I've got a region or I've got a curve which represents a set of these points or vectors, okay? So we can do it in the Cartesian plane. There is no reason why we can't do it in the complex plane, all right? But just remembering that when you think about points and vectors, we stop thinking about these just as, as like numerically, right? We start thinking about them geometrically. So therefore, we're going to get things that represent geometry, basically, right? Now, when we thought about geometry and graphing, we had a whole new set of ideas based around that, and we called it locus, right? So doing graphs in the complex plane, drawing curves and regions on an Argand diagram, or determining the locus of complex numbers that fit a certain geometric pattern or rule, those are just three different ways of saying the same thing, all the same idea. Okay, so let's have a look at some really simple examples first. We'll begin right down the bottom of the ladder. Okay, so here, just like here, right? I'm not just giving you one complex number. I'm asking for all of the complex numbers that obey this property. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now we can think about this in a variety of ways. We can think about this algebraically. We can think about it geometrically. I'm going to do both, okay? The absolute value, the modulus of z. What is that? Like if z is x plus i, y, how do I calculate the modulus of z? I'll give you a clue. It starts with that. Square root x squared. x squared plus y squared. I'm taking those coefficients of the real imaginary parts, right? So I've got this, like so, okay? Now if I want to graph this thing, well, I guess I should probably square things out so it's nice and simple. And I know exactly what this shape is. This is a circle, circle with center uh, at the origin, radius two. two, okay? Which of course we ought to have expected because what does this mean geometrically? This means our distance from the origin, I want that whole set of points whose distance from the origin is two, which of course is this circle. Okay, so let's just quickly draw it. Okay, this is just a simple one to begin. Okay. Well, isn't it, is it because absolute value is plus minus Okay. You okay? Yeah, alright. Now just think about it, right? What this means, I'm going to come back over here. What this means is that I can pick any point on, say, this blue parabola, right? Point like, say, here. I can take its y value, and I can take its x value, and they will satisfy this equation, right? Over here, I should be able to take any of these coordinates. Like, let's put z there or put it here, or anywhere else you'd like. And if you take the modulus to that point, you'll get two. Right, does that make sense? So, 
that's that's all we mean. That's that's not complicated. That's like, oh, this is pretty this is pretty um pretty calm. Let's have a look at another kind of example. Let's say mm, yeah, we'll do this one. <coughs> oh, what, bread then? Yeah, let's do this. Actually I'll I'll exclude the map. That's a little more interesting. Okay, well, what does this mean? Well, this is a little trickier to think about exclusively geometrically, but not that much harder. Let's think about the algebra first and then see what that tells us about the geometry, okay? Z is a complex number. By definition, that means it's got a real and an imaginary part. Z bar is the conjugate, which means in this particular complex number, it's going to be? X minus one. X minus, good. Now we've noticed like the important thing about conjugates is that when you do lots of operations on them, all you get left with is the real component, right? So you can see my two imaginary parts here are going to cancel. That gives me this. And then all I need to do is divide through. Okay? So I know how to graph this. In fact, I almost did just over here. I just need to shift it a little bit. Let's draw it. not inclusive of the boundary, so I'm going to put a dotted line in for that boundary, x equals 2. And then everything over here, every complex number over here has a real component that's bigger than 2. That's simple, right? By the way, you can notice, I could have just as easily said, could just as easily have stated that as the real component of z being greater than 2. Like, do you see how those are the same thing? It's just different notation. Um. I know they're related, but um, you see how um, the dotted line you drew, there's the arrow on the top and the bottom? Yep. Right? Is it es essential to have those arrows? Um, I wouldn't think of any reason why you wouldn't, because yeah. it does it does go on forever. Yeah. Um, in some ways, if I if I had not, being that there's no like filled or hollow circles, that also kind of implies that it's going forever, because I've never said it stops. But being that I mean that it's going to go on forever. I don't see any reason not to. Put the Would it also imply an asymptote if you, if you wait? No, asymptotes. You, you draw the okay. Okay. Asymptotes are arbitrary. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's where that's where we start to get out of like how many different ways can I draw a line to indicate it's a line but it's not a line that's on there? And yeah, I think that's fairly unambiguous. Um, you know, so you were over there. You said x and real that are like you must say. Yes. So you know when you label the axes, can you write x and y instead of imaginary and real? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to... <laughs> in a real... I was going to say in a real sense. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Because I'm strictly saying this is the complex plane. Right? If I just say, if I just label this x and y, there's nothing there to indicate at the moment that there's any imaginary component to this. Right? For all I know, this is a real number, and this is also a real number. Hence the Cartesian plane, not the complex plane. Right? So even though this is talking about y values, it's not just talking about y values. I'm specifying, by way of the labels on the axes, that these y values are not real. They are imaginary. Okay? So to say real z here indicates like the values, not the actual axis itself. Does that make sense? So I, I'm still going to call them real and imaginary. Okay. Yeah. Um, because when I, whenever I draw this sort of graph, right, and because there's no equal sign, I usually put a circle on the where x equals to two. Is that? You mean here? Yeah. Like, like there? A, yeah. An open circle there. Um. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get to where you need to include open circles and where you don't need to. I don't think there's anything. I don't think that takes away from the answer. But I don't think it adds anything either. Like the dotted line already indicates I'm excluding that boundary and I can't go on there. Okay? There will be points later on that we'll look at, fingers crossed, this lesson, where you do actually have to specify that. But you generally have to specify it where you've included the boundary except for a particular spot. Whereas here, my dotted line already excludes the boundary because it's a dotted line. Okay? Now, just really quickly, before we leave this diagram, um, let's just be a bit cheap. If I asked you, for instance, now that you know this, that these are equivalent. If I just said, okay, now graph for me this, where would that be? What would that look like? That's imaginary, right? So that's my up down, okay? And you'd put in one and then you'd say, notice I've included my boundary, and then you say everything underneath. 
Right, so this is not a complicated idea. I almost said it wasn't a complex idea, but it is a complex <laughs> idea, just not that complicated, okay?